how unfortunate it would be if the way the world is put together, that we are not the authors of our lives. Current physics says that at the quantum level, at least, uh, the universe is indeterministic. But at the macro level, it pretty much isn't. It doesn't matter whether the universe is deterministic or indeterministic, because when we say somebody has free will, what we should mean is that they are a morally competent agent. Moral competence is the anchor of free will. It's, it's what matters the most. Now. If we start with the idea of a morally competent agent, then we can work backwards and say, well, all right, what, what has to be true physically about their brain and the world in order for there to be a morally competent agent? And what we learn is that determinism and indeterminism have nothing to do with it. It's simply an orthogonal issue. It does not come up. If you then start looking at what goes into moral competence? You find self-control, uh, imagination, the capacity to think about the future, the capacity to be moved by reasons, uh, the capacity to respond to persuasion. That's what responsible comes from. If, if you are a moral agent, you are a reasonable, well-informed, self-controlled person. And that's a pretty good thing to be, and it has nothing to do with physics. Physics hasn't changed in the last million years, but there weren't any agents with free will on the planet a million years ago, and there are now. What's changed is not the physics, what's changed is biology. Free will, free willed agents have evolved. If you want to understand free will, you have to understand how it could evolve. How could you start in a lifeless world with no agents and gradually get bacteria? Now, bacteria have some degrees of freedom. They have some little, little control circuits. They are self-controlled to some degree. They're quite remarkable in that way. And then you get larger and larger, uh, you get multicellular life. And most multicellular life doesn't have free will in any interesting sense. A tree can, can protect itself in various ways but it's, it, it doesn't have any imagination, any foresight, and it has very limited degrees of freedom in the engineering sense. Once you start getting the animals, though, things that move about, things that have limbs that act, now you have more degrees of freedom to control. And for every degree of freedom to control, you have, con you have to have a control system. And so what has evolved is more and more elaborate, sophisticated, far-sighted, forward-looking, reflective controllers. We are the champions on the planet so far. We have the look-ahead capacity. We can, we can conceive of our own death. We can conceive of events happening hundreds of years in the future. We can imagine in great detail different courses of action that we might embark on. We could start tomorrow on a project that wouldn't be finished for 500 years, but we could say exactly what project it was. There's no other creature that can do anything like that. We are the ones, thanks to our brains, who have important projects that are under their control. And that's what makes for moral responsibility, and that's what makes for free will. And it has really nothing to do with physics at all. This kind of free will, compatibilism, can ignore the question of determinism and indeterminism altogether. We are just like very sophisticated machines, and the notion of free will, that is, the ability to be morally responsible, is something that is unrelated to how determined the machine is. I mean, think of it this way, in the robotics world, 
you can see these incredible robots they're building now, sophisticated and everything, and, and they're just going to get better and better and better. And uh, and then you you sit, you imagine down the hundred years from now or fifty years, whatever it is, someone says, "Okay, guys, we've got this thing pretty good now. Can someone just put in here the free will chip?" What? what? The engine? What? What are you talking about? No, no, we got this thing working. It's 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 deciding things. It's responding to its internal states, its external states. It's making good decisions. It's under. What, what's this thing you want to put in there? <laughs> it makes no sense. So, okay, here's this wonderful machine, the human body, the human brain. It works in a particular way. Neuroscience is trying desperately to figure out how it works. But having established how it works, uh, which is the goal, it's by no, by no means here at the present, which is the goal. Uh, having established, does that mean we don't have uh, all of a sudden the free will? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you just jump from, we're trying to understand how this, this machine works to this other question. And the, is that other question even appropriate? So I say, no, it's not appropriate. The notion of personal responsibility is what's key here. Personal responsibility comes from your membership in a social group. The minute you are with another human being on this earth, you have an obligation to them and responsibility comes at that layer, as I, I think in terms of layers, that that layer, at the social layer. And no matter how determined you are through the physical forces that control your own mind, uh, you are accountable for this, this rule that you have uh, made with the other human being on this earth. And that's where responsibility is to be determined, found, not, not in someone's brain. If free will is then just a condition of responsibility between people in a social group, then to know more about its origins, we have to question the notion of responsibility itself. And this means questioning the origins of morality. Philosophers for hundreds of years have considered theories which were often called contractarian theories, which say that morality arises out of, out of an agreement of some sort, a, a contract, a, a, uh, a, 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 like a parliament coming together and making some uh, uh, laws and agreeing to abide by them. Uh, Hobbes in the social contract in the Leviathan is the beginning of this. I think Hobbes is exactly right that in the non-human world, there's no morality. No amorality, no immorality. I mean, there's amorality, there's no morality. Um, uh, lions eating cubs, it's not immoral. It's just, morality is just not in that world. It's not in the natural world. But it is in our world. It, that means it's a, in some sense, it's a construction, a creation of human minds and activities and agreements. Now the question is, how do we think about it? How do we think about how it evolved and the evolution of language, the evolution of culture? And we can come to appreciate what series of actual, physical, historical events could have gradually created the mindset, the creeds, the ideas, the dispositions, the attitudes that we tend to share. Now, people aren't all alike, but there's a remarkable amount of consensus about what's bad and what's good and who's responsible and who isn't. It's always under refinement. If we look at what counts as morality today, it's very different from what it was a few thousand years ago and better. Why is it better? Because we're more enlightened. We've come to appreciate more about what matters to people and what hurts them and how bad cruelty is, and we still have a ways to go, but we're on that track, so. Morality is an achievement, a construction, a creation of human societies. And free will is a part of that edifice in that it's the moral competence to be a member of the Moral Agents Club. 
That too is a notion that's under refinement. What are the, what are the requirements? Well, we don't we don't let little children into the moral agents club. We we train them up so that they can be eligible for membership when they get older. Uh, um, and at the end of life, when people get senile and childish, we very gently and regretfully exclude them from the Moral Agents Club. We no longer let them sign contracts. We no longer let them uh, go out on their own. We take away their driver's licenses, all sorts of things like that. They, they have lost the competence that's requisite for being out and about as a free agent. In normal people, there is this happy, happy middle ground, the Moral Agents Club. The benefits are fantastic. If you're a member in good standing, you are free to make contracts, to make promises, to, to, to get married, to get divorced, to have long-term projects, to have the freedom of the road and travel where you want, get a passport, all of those good things. But the deal is, in order to have that, you have to sign on, in effect, to being liable for the misdeeds you perform. This wonderful, invention that humanity has created, namely morality and law and order, has very good consequences, which depend on various features of the system. And one of the features is that you're punished for your misdeeds. I'm going to hold you responsible for your actions uh, if you're going to be part of my social group. And, and we all understand what that means. So I think it's recognizing that we all function within a social layer. I mean, that there's there's no concept of resp personal responsibility if you're the only person in the world. You're, you're, that's just gone. This kind of free will then exists only if others exist around us. It's a cultural construct that's useful in a community of individuals. And for most things, it works well enough. But it does have its problems, mainly due to the fact that the world remains fully determined. This is why the libertarian kind of free will still has so much traction, because it does address these issues. And the first one has to do with control. Sometimes people write to me, claim that everything must be completely determined because science has figured out most of the causal laws of nature and, and that they think they must be completely determined. And uh, some talk about they, they're like a puppet. They just don't know what the strings are that are manipulating what they do. Let's look at this idea about being a puppet. Um, a puppet is under the control of somebody else, the puppeteer. Now. It would be terrible to be a puppet controlled by some puppeteer. But now, how about a puppet that was controlled by itself? Would that be terrible? It wouldn't be being a puppet. Now, are you a puppet that's controlled by yourself? Yeah, there you are. You're, you're the boss. You're the self-controller. Um, the environment doesn't control you. The, your history doesn't control you. Control involves feedback. It involves feedback loops. And to be a controller, it's not just a, to be a cause of something. You've got to be able to modulate the further causes as a result of your reflection on what's happening. Um, I can't control a model airplane if I if I can't see where it's flying in the air. I can I can push the, the lever around, but it will just fly into the ground or something. That's, that's causation, but it isn't control. If I'm in control, it's, I've got to be able to modulate the causation to accomplish some purpose. That's what control is. If you're not being controlled by another person, by another agent, you're not being controlled. So you're not being controlled by your genes, you're not being controlled by the past. Now, you could become, you could fall into the control, under the control of somebody, a manipulator, an evil manipulator, and it's no accident 
that the free will literature is full of thought experiments about evil secret manipulators, and they're scary and spooky as the devil, but they don't exist. Control can be restored here with intent. We have a purpose and a well-engineered body to accomplish it, and that's what gives us control. But this doesn't take away the fact that if we could understand the brain fully, we would be able to predict what it does. One way to respond to this is by appealing to the idea of layers. Even if at the biological layer of the brain, we are determined, once we go up to the social layer, our interactions are so complex that they could not be predicted anyway. Just like with traffic. Understanding how engines work doesn't predict car crashes. Everybody's trying to figure out how one level of organization, which is the platform for the next level of organization, uh, everybody's trying to figure out how those different layers interact. And so because of that, uh, what uh, is manifest as the next layer is actually determined by the, the, uh, the uh, uh, preceding layer. And uh, I, I don't think that's how you look at it. The car analogy was that here you have this highly determined machine, this phys chemical, physical nature no one argues with, it works in this particular way. And as much as you know about that, as, as much as we all agree upon that, when that thing's thrown into uh, action in the presence of other cars, it in no way, in no way predicts traffic. In no way predicts how traffic occurs, how you deal with it at that level. And so, so too uh, with the human condition. The human condition is one thing we can understand this behaving uh, sophisticated machine uh, but now we put it into a social context and a whole set of other rules come in and uh, are, are, are powerful. So that general metaphor then becomes, well, uh, this becomes this emergent prop that there are all kinds of things going on at one level that become merely the platform for understanding the next level. At the social layer, the future may be in theory predictable, but in practice, it isn't, because it's too complex. In other words, society is a chaotic system. But everything is still, in principle, determined. If we turn back time, even in a chaotic, emergent system, things would play back exactly the same. And this is the core problem that libertarians have with compatibilism, and the reason why they need real quantum randomness. One of the great arguments in the field of free will philosophy is, could have done otherwise. Dan Dennett will say, what could it possibly mean to say could have done otherwise? The only thing you could have done is what you did do. What you did do is the actual. You can't change the past. Of course, you can't change the future either. Uh, and people often don't realize that. I sometimes ask my students, how many of you want to change the future? And a lot of hands go up. Oh, that sounds so heroic. Change the future. <laughs> From what to what? Uh, <laughs> Those who think uh, free will is compatible with determinism don't think that randomness or chance which, in my view, coming from quantum physics in the universe, is an answer to a question. It's, it seems like a, a cop-out. It isn't really giving us uh, the source of our freedom. Uh, some people think that you have to have, in effect, little Geiger counters in your brain that will amplify quantum indeterministic quantum effects in order to have free will. No, you don't need that. You do need something which looks a bit like it. You need to have a source of disorder, a source of randomness in a watered down sense. It doesn't have to be quantum randomness, but it has to be like the randomness on your computer. Your, every computer made has a random number generator in it one way or another. Those aren't really random numbers, but they're good enough. You need that to do random sampling. You need that to do Monte Carlo methods. You need that 
in a thousand ways. Programs rely on randomness. Whenever the program has to make a decision, it doesn't have enough information to make a decision so that it doesn't just sit there like Buridan's ass. It flips a die and goes left or right depending on how it comes up. So you need a little dice flipper in there. You need a little roulette wheel in there to, uh, to get you to move when you don't have a good reason to move one way or the other. And that comes up all the time in programs. And so that's why computers have so-called random number generators in them, but they're pseudo-random number generators. The whole brain is, is a uh, sort of a pseudo-random generating probabilistic uh, semi-chaotic bunch of stuff going on. Order is imposed on it to some degree and it is something of an achievement that there is as much order as there is. That's what, that's what the design of the brain is all about, is, 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 is evincing enough order out of this chaotic interaction. You need the chaos, but you also need the order. The brain is a wonderfully complex device that allows for all the input, all the genetic influences, all the cultural influences to be mixed into this big decision matrix upon which you decide to make a decision. And so freedom, and the way I put it, is freedom is, is, a, is a function of how much information and the quality of information you can get into to make your decision. Nobody can ever consider all things. So no matter how hard you think about a moral decision, you're only going to scratch the surface. You want to make sure, if you're a moral agent, that you scratch the right parts of the surface. In this, it's like, it's like chess playing. You, you want to find the best move, all things considered, but you can't consider all things. So you consider the most important things and make your best move on the basis of that. That's the way life is. You, you ask, what really matters here? What, what do I need to understand? What do I need to know? What facts do I have to find out before I decide? That's what a responsible agent does. And the very process of doing that search, doing the considerations, is one which is benefited by a little bit of coin flipping. Because you're never going to know you've thought about it enough. So at some point, basically, you flip a coin and say, OK, that's enough. If you think it helps that that moment is due to the amplification of a quantum random event, help yourself, but it's not going to add anything. It could be quantum random, it could be pseudo random. What matters is that there's some chaos there. Here is where compatibilism and libertarianism connect. They both need chaos to amplify the randomness in the brain. They just disagree on the source of this randomness. But compatibilism can allow a quantum random event to happen in the brain. It's just not needed because the brain can produce a pseudo-randomness that does the job. And so amusingly, Dennett and Doyle have very similar arguments. Dennett is saying, we don't need quantum randomness because the brain can generate pseudo-randomness. And Doyle is saying, we don't need the brain to generate pseudo-randomness because there's already quantum randomness in there. If the brain found it useful to generate randomness, as Dan Dennett wants to believe in his description of the two-stage model with his computer pseudo-random generator, if the brain needed a way to generate new ideas, it doesn't have to have a computer-like power inside it. It could just use natural quantum randomness in the universe. The only problem is the influence of quantum randomness on the brain is still up for debate. And this is the point compatibilists will make. Why rely on it? Why take our chances with quantum physics in the brain when pseudo-randomness is good enough? When I have addressed the people who say we want more or one wants more, then why? What for? I've put that challenge to various people. Um, Doyle is 
the one uh, philosopher of free will who really took the challenge seriously and pushed me very hard on it. And I finally conceded to him that I could now dream of one circumstance where I would want indeterministic freedom. And that was if I was playing rock, paper, and scissors with God for head, big stakes. If you didn't have real randomness, then God, who knows everything, could read your mind. Then I would really have a reason to want to have indeterministic free will, but I can't think of any other reason.